So tonight what I'd like to do is to do a walkthrough of different Christian perspectives on origins. So I titled it Surveying the Origins Landscape, How Christians View Science, the Bible, and Evolution. If nothing else, if you get nothing else out of this lecture, you get to see a beautiful picture by my friend Tom Ward. Tom Ward is uh, a friend, uh, he's a theologian, and he's also a Facebook friend, and the main benefit of having Tom as a Facebook friend is that you get inundated with amazing photographs. He's not a professional photographer, but he, he could be. And here's one of his images, and I, he graciously allowed me to use it for this slide to illustrate that. So even if you get nothing else out of it, you get to see a beautiful picture by Tom. Okay. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to do just sort of a tour, and it's meant to be a fairly dispassionate tour on my part. So I obviously hold a position, all of us do, maybe some positions are more you know, strongly held than others, but all Christians have at least some working understanding of how science and scripture might relate to one another, what aspects of modern science they might think are okay, and other, others that they might think are suspect. What I'm going to do tonight is take a tour through different Christian views on science with respect to, to um, astronomy, age of the earth, evolution, those types of things, just to sort of lay out what the landscape looks like and also comment on what their various strengths and weaknesses might be. And what I'm attempting to do tonight, we'll see how well it comes off, but my intent tonight is to do it as dispassionately as possible, as if anyone who was present here if, if anyone was present here who was an adherent to any one of these views, that they would at least feel that their view had been accurately presented. Now, obviously, I have an, an opinion, and as a member, you know, as a someone who works with the BioLogos Foundation, you might already know what that particular viewpoint is, and that's fine. But that's the goal tonight, to try to lay it out as evenly and as dis dispassionately as possible. Okay, so let's get started. There's two general categories to think of as we enter the, this sort of um, catalog of different approaches that Christians have to science. Some Christians take what we would call a concordist view, and other Christians would take what we would call a non-concordist view. So a concordist view, in general terms, is has an expectation that what we read in Scripture, say in the Genesis narratives, should match up pretty evenly with what we see in science, that those things should concord with one another. This typically has the expectation that the, the Genesis authors had the same sort of categories in mind that we would have in the present day, and that there should be this correspondence between what we see in Genesis and what we see in science. A non-concordist view, on the other hand, don't expect that particular uh, correspondence. So they don't expect necessarily that we would what we see in Genesis should necessarily line up with what we discover through science. So present day concordist views would be things like young earth creationism, uh, the gap theory, which isn't that popular anymore, but it's a, a, a one that has been popular in prior, prior years, or an old earth creationist day age sort of interpretation. All of these are views that attempt to take what we see in Genesis and match them up with what we see in present-day science. Non-concordist views, on the other hand, would not have that expectation. Some commonly held non-concordist views in the present day would be something along the lines of, say, uh, John Walton's ancient Near East cosmology view or the temple inauguration view. This idea that what we're seeing in Genesis is actually not intended to correspond to the categories of science that we see in the present day, but are speaking about the concerns of the original audience of the Genesis narratives. Okay. There are two, so what we're going to start, we're going to start with concordist views and then we're going to talk about non-concordist views. The two most common concordist views in the present day are young earth creationism and old earth creationism, the day age view that's found within old earth creationism. I just mentioned gap theory. It used to be quite popular. It was popularized in the Schofield Reference Bible in uh, the early uh, 1900s, but later was eclipsed by the rise of young earth creationism in the 1960s. Now, some of you may know more about the scholarly origins of young earth creationism, how it started in the Seventh-day Adventist movement around the same time as the Schofield Reference Bible in the early 1900s, and then was brought over into evangelicalism in the 1960s uh, through the work of Henry Morrison and others. 
If you're interested in that level of understanding the history of these different movements, what I'll, a book I'll recommend right off the, uh, the bat is a book by a fellow named Ronald Numbers called The Creationists. Absolutely fantastic book if you're interested in understanding the different flavors of uh, the history of the different flavors of Christian creationism. Non-concordist views also have a long history within the church, so Augustine would be one example. What's quite interesting about the origins debate is that we look back in the history of the church, we often find individuals that don't neatly fit into present-day categories. So Augustine, as we'll see going forward, would have been a geocentrist, because everyone at that time was a geocentrist. So geocentrists hold um, that the Earth is actually the unmoving center of the universe. And we'll see in, in a little while that there are actually still Christians today that hold this particular view as a model of, of origins. So Augustine would have been a geocentrist because of his time and place, but he also held to a non-literal, what we would consider a non-literal understanding of Genesis. So Augustine, as a geocentrist, was also a young Earth creationist of a type because he held to a young earth, because everyone did back in that time, that evidence for the antiquity of the earth did not come until later in the 1700s. But despite this, Augustine held that all of creation was accomplished in an instant, so that God instantly created everything, and that Genesis was written with the form it has in order to be a theological exposition of what was actually going on. So we don't see this type of... Um, this type of view commonly represented in the church any longer. But as we look back in, uh, in church history, we see that these views were there. So we do have other non-concordist views that are more common, such as the ancient Near Eastern cosmology view and that I mentioned before. Okay, so here are the four views that we're going to take a look at tonight in some detail. Three concordist views and one non-concordist view. So with concordist views, we'll start with geocentrism. It's been present in the church from antiquity to the present day. Young Earth creationism, similarly, from antiquity to the present day. Old Earth creationism doesn't really get much traction in the church until the 1750s or so. This is when advances in geology are revealing to us that the Earth is old, and as that scientific evidence comes in, we see Christians that begin to hold that particular view within, within Christianity. And then evolutionary creationism, sometimes called theistic evolution, uh, has been present in the church since about the 1850s. Of course, this is at the time when uh, Darwin's Origin of Species was published in 1859. And as with older creationism coming in as scientific evidence supports the antiquity of the earth, so too we see Christians beginning to adopt an evolutionary creationist perspective once the evidence for evolution has been presented. Okay, for each viewpoint, what we're going to do is we're going to consider what the basic tenets are of that particular view, maybe with some, also with some comments on views on scriptural interpretation within that view. We'll look at various strengths. Those strengths will be as they are perceived within the group. We'll also look at weaknesses. One of the things that you will notice about this uh, sort of going through the different views is that no view is immune from criticism. Whatever view you happen to hold as a Christian on origins, you will be critiqued by someone else. And so there are no exceptions here. So for every view, there will be weaknesses as perceived by individuals who are not within that group. And then we'll also talk a little bit about the disposition that one group has towards members of another group. Okay, let's start with geocentrism. It might seem a little bit surprising to you that I say that geocentrism is present in the church from antiquity to the present day. You might say, hmm, wait a minute, geocentrism in the present day, nobody, nobody actually thinks that geocentrism is true anymore. Well, that's not, that's not correct. There are Christians out there, they are not very few in number, but there are Christians out there who strongly believe that geocentrism is the proper way to view science from within a Christian perspective. So they hold that the Bible is the inspired and inerrant word of God. They feel, or they strongly believe that the earth is unmoving and at the center of the universe. That means that the universe rotates around the earth once a day. Sometimes there's some confusion on this point. Sometimes people think that geocentrism means they're okay with the earth rotating on its axis as long as it's not going around the sun. But that's not the case. 
Geocentrism actually holds that the Earth is absolutely static and unmoving at the center of the universe, and that the entire universe rotates around the Earth once every 24 hours. And that's simply because when you observe uh, stars at night, they, if you, you know, if you've ever done, seen those time exposures, what people do with, with star trails, we observe that the stars move around us once every 24 hours from our perspective, if you hold to a geocentric perspective. They feel that the universe is young, about six to 10,000 years old, and they feel that current scientific ideas such as heliocentrism, the notion that the sun is the center of our solar system, Big Bang cosmology, geology, and evolution, and the like are wrong, scientifically incorrect, and harmful to Christians. They feel that scripture is best interpreted in its plain, literal sense. So interestingly, sort of key individuals, this particular position on origins can claim a long history within the church. And the reason for this is prior to the work of Copernicus and Galileo, everybody was geocentrist. So therefore, by default, all the church fathers, early church fathers, would have been geocentrist. The, the authors of scripture themselves likely would have been geocentrist, and so on. So what's interesting is theologians up until the time of Copernicus remained geocentrist, but there was a large number of them that remained geocentrist after Copernicus as well. Even though in the present day there are very few geocentrists left, um, they, there are still a few out there. There was actually a movie that came out not too long ago that some of you may have seen on Facebook. Um, it was a, a movie that I think the title of it was, was you know, Galileo was wrong. And uh, it was a popular movie that was promoted by present-day geocentrists. They have almost no impact at all on the current directions debate among Christians because of their few numbers, generally speaking. So here's one geocentrist from the past. This is Martin Luther. Martin Luther lived at a time when Copernicanism, this idea that heliocentrism might be a new, new way of thinking about how the solar system was organized, uh, lived, and he, this, here's his take on it. So he says, you know, there's talk of a new astrologer. Astrology was the way of talking about astronomy back in that time. He wants to prove that the earth moves and goes around instead of, the, instead of the sky, the sun, and the moon, just as if someone were moving in a character ship might hold that he was sitting still and at rest while the earth and the trees walked and moved. But that is how things are nowadays. When a man wishes to be clever, he must invent something special, and the way he does it must need to be the best. The fool wants to turn the whole art of astronomy upside down. However, as Holy Scripture tells us, so did Joshua bid the sun to stand still and not the earth. So the Joshua 10 narrative is a key uh, passage that gets argued over at this time in the, in the heliocentrist, geocentrist debate. And it was felt that proper interpretation of Joshua 10 would not permit a heliocentric reading. So that was right around the time when these ideas were new in the church. Here's a later apologist. This is John Edwards. John Edwards is not uh, Jonathan Edwards, the Puritan theologian that you might be thinking of. Sometimes there's confusion on this point. John Edwards is an English apologist who lived um, in the late 1600s and wrote um, a large book. I can assure you that when my, you know, Scott and, my, and I proposed a title for our book, we certainly wouldn't get away with a title this long, but this is what titles looked like back then. And interestingly enough, this is just the title. There's a subtitle after this. <laughs> so what does John Edwards say? say? He says, the Copernican opinion, so heliocentrism, seems to confront a higher principle than that of reason. So reason, of science, you know, reasoning, he says, look, Copernicanism hits up against something that is higher than reason. He says, if we speak of men of religion and as such own the Bible, so own it in the sense of we acknowledge it as our authority, we must acknowledge that their assertion is against the plain history of the Holy Book. For there we read that the sun stood still in Joshua's time and went back in King Hezekiah's. So Joshua 10 there again in view, and also... Um, the miracle where Hezekiah asks for the sun to go back up the stairs as a sign from God. So Edwards continues, he says, Now this relation is either true or false. If it be the latter, then inspired scripture is false, which I take to be as great an absurdity as any man can be produced to. If it be the former, i.e. if the relation is really true, 
Then the sun hath the diurnal motion about the earth, for the sun standing still would not be a strange and wonderful thing, as it is here represented, unless its general course was to move. So what Edwards is basically saying at this point, and now this is, you know, this is, what, a good 80, 90 years after Galileo, even. We've already had Newton publishing on, you know, Newton's Principia has already been published about the laws of gravitation and whatnot. And Edwards is holding the fort on geocentrism and saying you can have, you can either be, you know, you can have geocentrism and scripture, but you cannot have heliocentrism and scripture. They simply don't go together. Okay, so that was the late 1600s. Here's the present day. There are some, so if you want, you can go online and look at this. This is from Galileo was wrong. This is uh, .com. And this is a movie. This was advertising this movie that came out a little while ago. It wasn't released in theaters, it was direct to DVD, but it's there, you can rent it if you want to. And it attempts to establish a case that scientifically, that geocentrism is the preferred scientific interpretation for what we see in the cosmos, and how this aligns well with scriptural interpretation. So they, they, they feel that the church, when it acquiesced to Galileo, that they had it all wrong. Okay. So what sort of strengths perceived within the group would we see here in this particular view of science and origins? They would see themselves as holding to a very consistent hermeneutic. One thing that geocentrism can sort of has going for it is that they have a very consistent hermeneutic about how they approach the Bible. What you'll see with geocentrists is they will sometimes criticize younger creationists who also have, in many ways, a, uh, what they consider a very literal hermeneutic for understanding scripture. The geocentrists will criticize younger creationists by saying, well, you have a general literal hermeneutic, sure, but there's a couple of verses that you're ignoring, and you're ignoring the geocentric implications of those verses. So Joshua 10 is a key example, the Hezekiah miracle is another one, and Psalm 104.5 there is an example. When we read this verse now, in the present day, you know, that God sets the earth on its foundations and it will not be moved, we don't think of that in scientific terms as speaking to whether or not the earth moves or not. But it very much was felt to be that, speaking to those concerns, prior to the work of the Brunicus and Galileo. So in terms of weaknesses, oh sorry, another strength of course is that it has a long history within the church. Now of course this view would have a long history within the church. It had an uninterrupted run of about 1600 years within the church before after Parnas and Galileo came along. So in some ways, if, if geocentrism has bragging rights on that front, they have the longest uninterrupted theological agreement of any of the views that we're going to discuss tonight. It's only lately that we've come to reject it. Weaknesses, obviously, is those perceived by those outside the group. The main critique of geocentrism, obviously, is that it doesn't have any scientific support for a geocentric universe. If you're going to hold to a geocentric view of the universe, it requires a rejection of virtually all of modern science. There are very few things that you can potentially hold, agree with in modern science and be a geocentrist. You know, things as basic as gravity, for example, are, are not, don't work within a geocentric viewpoint. Okay, so how does geocentrism relate to other groups? Their disposition to other groups is generally a view that those outside their group are compromisers, that they've compromised on the authority of scripture. That's their general take on things. So they didn't. But I would say that because of their small numbers, they're not overly vocal about that. Typically, you will not find entire denominations that are devoted to geocentrism, because geocentrism is such a minority viewpoint at this point. Individuals that hold this view generally are willing to make common cause with young Earth creationists on many points. Okay, that brings us to young Earth creationism, which has also been in the church from antiquity to the present day. The basic tenets here and their views on scriptural interpretation is, again, that the Bible is inspired and inherent. They feel, as do geocentrists, that do that the Bible teaches creation ex nihilo, so from nothing, in six 24-hour days, approximately six to 10,000 years ago, and that there is no death before the fall. Now, 
If you're interested in these things at an academic level, that is not absolutely strictly true. If you read this one paper by a young earth creationist researcher that we'll discuss in a minute, he discusses the possibility of bacterial death before the fall. And the reason for that is that it's actually challenging, even from a young earth perspective, to have even a few days or weeks of unmitigated bacterial replication without any death involved. So he discusses that possibly there may have been bacterial death before the fall because of that. They feel that the Bible teaches that modern species arise from separate kinds. The, the word that they use to describe this is baramin. It's a word that they've coined. Um, a min is the Hebrew word for kind. When In Genesis, God talks about creating organisms according to their kind. Kind is the word min, and bara is the word that's used there for create. So created kind is sometimes referred to in the Young Earth Creationist literature as the Barrowman, created kind. They also feel that humans are created in the image of God and share no other, show, share no ancestry with other forms of life. So what's interesting about Young Earth Creationism, they have this issue where they, they also feel that not only are kinds created during the creation week, they feel that all species on Earth in the present day descend from the animals that Noah had with him on the ark. So the challenge that you see in young earth creationism that we won't see in old earth creationism is there's no need in old earth creationism to shove as many possible animals onto the ark because old earth creationists typically don't believe that the flood was global, that it covered the entire globe. Young earth creationists very much do feel that the flood was global and covered the entire globe. So as a result, the millions of species that we see in the present day need to descend from a very small group of species that are present on Noah's Ark. So the interesting thing about that is that young earth creationism actually proposes speciation levels that far, far exceed mainstream evolutionary biology. So you have this small group of, of less than, I think it's around 2,000 species or so that are present on the Ark, some, some, on somewhere in that order of magnitude that nonetheless have to diversify into the millions of species that we see on the Earth, and this all has to happen within about 4,000 years. So interestingly enough, even though young Earth creationism rejects many aspects of evolutionary biology, they themselves hold to a version of speciation that radically exceeds what evolutionary biology uh, claims is possible. Interesting. Just one of those quirks. Okay, so other views that they have, they feel that the majority of the geologic record was laid down catastrophically during Noah's flood, and they feel that cultural acceptance of geological history, what they would call millions of years, is, is sort of a catchword, is a significant step towards rejecting biblical authority and accepting evolutionary ideas. So here's Henry Morris, who was one of the individuals who was absolutely key in taking young earth creationists ideas from Seventh-day Adventism in the early 1900s, Young Earth Creationist Geology, and bringing it over to the, to the evangelical mainstream in the 1960s, the early 1960s. So Henry Morris and a, a theologian named John Whitcomb wrote a book called The Genesis Flood, in, published in 1961. You have to remember what was going on in America in the late 1950s, if you think about 19, 1959, 1959 is what? It's the 100 year anniversary of the publication of The Origin of Species. So you have a lot of stuff going on in the United States and in Canada and elsewhere in Europe to commemorate and celebrate 100 years of publication of The Origin of Species. So Christians are hearing all about evolution in ways that they haven't heard about evolution in a long time in the public press. And a lot of them are feeling that this is very, you know, this pro-evolutionary messaging that they're hearing, that this is not Christian, that this is counter to a Christian view of creation. And then Morris and Whitcomb step into that void at just that time in the early 1960s with the Genesis Flood, which presents young Earth creationist geology taken from uh, Seventh-day Adventism and promotes it within evangelical circles as the effective rebuttal to the evolution messaging that they've been hearing. So it was a very, it was sort of a very opportune time for this form of creationism to gain ascendancy in the United States and elsewhere. So this is Henry Morris, this is what he says. 
It says, all things in the universe were created and made by God in six literal days of the creation week, described in Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3, and confirmed in Exodus. The creation record is factual, historical, perspicuous. Thus, all theories of origins or development which involve evolution in any way, or any, sorry, in any form, are false. So that, there you go, in a nutshell, a good explanation, a good summary of what young earth creationism entails. Young earth creationism is also not shy about saying that they go with the Bible over against what they see in science. So here's a, a well-known uh, young earth creationist researcher, Andrew Snelling, and some comments that he made at a conference. He says, you know, basically in a nutshell, even if there was no evidence for young earth creationism, now Andrew Snelling very much strongly believes that there is evidence for young earth creationism, but he said, even if there wasn't any evidence at all, would you still believe that the universe was young? And he says, yes, because God words, God's word teaches it. That's the only reason you need to believe that the universe is young. God word, God's word says it, therefore I believe it. So there's no, there's no um, shame in the young earth creationist movement to say that they go with the Bible as they perceive it over against what they might see in science. Okay, key organizations and people. We've already mentioned Henry Morris who was uh, instrumental in starting an organization called the Institution, Institute for Creation Research, or ICR. ICR was very much the premier young earth creationist organization until it was eclipsed by Answers in Genesis uh, later on. So Answers in Genesis by far and away now is the most well-known and best organized and funded proponent uh, organization that promotes, promotes young earth creationism. And it's headed by uh, Ken Ham, that individual there. Unlike geocentrism, this is a very well-connected, a very populous, and very influential group in the creationism discussion in North America. So specific, especially within North American Protestant congregations, you'll see some young earth creationism also in Catholic circles, but it tends to be mostly young earth uh, um, North American Protestants. What's interesting about young earth creationism is that there's a bit of tension between scholarly workers in the field who are young earth creationists and the actual advocacy organizations such as Answers in Genesis. So just two scholars that I'll highlight here as an example of that. The first is Todd Wood. Todd Wood used to teach at Bryan College. And he's now at an organization called the Center for Origins Research. It used to be physically housed within Bryan, but now it's an independent organization as I understand it. And Todd has been there through, throughout that transition. Todd is a systematic biologist. He has a PhD in biology. He specializes in plant adaptation and phylogeny, so he's interested about in how plants are related to one another. But he also writes widely on creation and evolution issues from a young earth creationist perspective. I also count him as a friend. I haven't yet met him in person, but I hope to. But we communicate online and uh, we enjoy each other's friendship, even though we hold quite different views on this particular topic. The other individual I'll mention to you is uh, Kurt Wines. I mentioned one of his papers earlier on. He did that paper discussing whether bacteria might have died before the fall. Kurt is a paleontologist who studied under Stephen Jay Gould. Now, those of us of a certain age will know who Stephen Jay Gould is, a very famous um, paleontologist and also popular writer about evolutionary biology. So Kurt Wise has had a training in evolutionary biology that is also at a very high level. He has a PhD and was trained by very well-respected individuals. Now, the main point to make here is that young earth creationist researchers seem to have a lot less influence than young earth creationist ministries do. Todd Wood, for example, some of the things that he has written, and we'll see some of those things later, are actually quite controversial within the young earth creationist community, because Todd and Kurt also, to a certain extent, they acknowledge that the evidence for evolutionary biology is quite strong. So that makes them somewhat different from other members of the young earth creationist community, and they catch flack for it. Okay, so strengths, as perceived within the group, they feel that they have a very strong commitment to the authority of scripture, a consistent hermeneutic, although the geocentrists, of course, would beg to differ on that point, but young earth creationists feel that they have a consistent hermeneutic, and that they also have a long history within the church. Although, as, we'll, as we've seen with Augustine, even though Augustine was a young earth creationist, he held a different view of what how Genesis should be interpreted. So you've got Augustine saying, Creation is instantaneous, and Genesis is written for our benefit in order to understand what the theology of what's going on. Weaknesses, as perceived by individuals outside the group, 
Scientists outside young Earth creationism um, hold that there's no evidence for a young Earth, or that the scientific evidence very, very strongly points to an ancient Earth, and that there's no evidence for the special creation of those different groups of organisms. So, what, whereas young Earth creationism would like to find original created kinds that were pre present at Creation Week and then had a representative on the Ark, Evolutionary biologists say we haven't yet been able to find any evidence that supports that hypothesis. It looks like all creatures on Earth are related to one another. If you're going to hold to a young Earth creationist view, it also requires a rejection of a large amount of present-day science. So there's a lot in modern physics that's problematic. Astronomy, for example, Big Bang cosmology, of course, doesn't work if you're a young Earth creationist. Certain, certain aspects of chemistry don't work, um, specifically those that uh, relate to radiometric dating techniques and so on. And of course, biology is disputed. Although, as we've made that point uh, before, interestingly, young Earth creationists, in, for, some, for most species, posit a much more rapid speciation than evolutionary biologists do. But they also posit that humans have, have not been part of that, that humans are a lineage that was never part of any of the, any other animal lineages. Interestingly enough, Todd Wood also disputes that to a certain degree. Todd is actually okay with speciation among humans as well, from within a young earth creationist perspective. Okay, so young earth creationism, of course, gets critiqued from the outside. The main critique, of course, relates to the science that young earth creationism is trying to portray. So just here's just some examples of the types of critiques in general terms that scientists offer to young earth creationists. So you remember the one young earth creationist view that we looked at was that all geologic strata, or the vast majority of them, were laid down catastrophically during Noah's flood. This actually makes strong predictions about what you should observe in the fossil record. You should observe a relatively randomized distribution of different fossils within the fossil record. If they were all of those species were present at creation week, and then present at the time of the flood, and all of those layers were laid down within one year during the flood, that makes some pretty clear predictions about where you should find different things. For example, where should you find humans, human remains? It should be pretty much all through the column. Mammals should be all through the column, that sort of thing. So what's interesting, though, is that when you look at the geologic record, we don't find things randomly distributed through the record, as you might predict from a younger creationist point of view. Instead, what we see are particular species in, in particular layers and patterns of succession that seem to be worldwide. So I'll use one example from a friend of mine. This is from a paper that a friend of mine, Joel Duff, wrote a number of years ago. It's a rather unspectacular example of a fossil, but it makes the point quite nicely. This is about fossil pollen and fossil spores. Now, nobody ever goes to the Smithsonian to see the, po the pollen fossils or the, or the spore fossils. Let me just explain what these things are. So pollen, if you have allergies, you know full well what pollen is. So pollen is made by flowering plants and grasses, for example, as flowering plants, and it's pervasive, it's everywhere. What's really interesting about pollen is you can find it in ice cores in Antarctica and in the Arctic. You can find it in marine sediment all over the planet because these little entities are so resistant and resilient and they spread so easily in wind. So you can find pollen all over the place in the present day. Interestingly enough, you cannot find pollen in the fossil record below the remains of flowering plants. And flowering plants, you might be surprised to know, Okay, here's flowering plants. Flowering plants are actually a relatively recent innovation on planet Earth, relatively speaking. So most of what you know is sort of the dinosaur era, as it were. Most of those dinosaurs didn't ever see a flowering plant, didn't see a flower. On the other hand, spores, so spores would be things produced by uh, mosses and ferns. If you've ever taken a bracken fern and flipped the leaf over and seen all those little dots on the bottom, those are the the cells that are producing spores. Spores, on the other hand, can be found much deeper in the column. So we can see them all the way back down here. So from a young Earth creationist perspective, this doesn't make any sense. It, all of these layers were laid down catastrophically in one year during the flood. You would expect to find pollen all throughout the column, but we don't. We only see it, and we only see flowering plants for that matter, higher up in the column and not all the way down. 
So what, if you, what does one do if one is a young earth creationist and you're trying to grapple with this sort of data? Well, what you see in young earth creationism is an attempt to deal with this data in a way that remains consistent with young earth creationist presuppositions. So this is one young earth creationist researcher publishing an, an article that attempts to deal with this. And he says, creationists, including myself, have provided a variety of alternative explanations for fossil succession. They include such mechanisms as the sorting of organisms during the flood. So some of young earth creationists sort of make differential buoyancy sort of arguments to say this is why things sort the way they do and why we see things in certain layers. Differential escape of organisms. So we would expect to see humans near the top because they would be better at escaping from the flood. That runs into problems as well because you would expect to see, you know, birds escaping even better and that sort of thing. They also have views of ecological zonation, so sometimes they'll make arguments to say, well, maybe all the mammals were together in one area, and all the reptiles were together in another area, and so on. And then we see progressive inundation by the flood of these different areas and such. So there's a variety of explanations on offer within Young Earth Creationism to account for the data. But none of these lines of evidence, or none of these models, have any way to deal with the pollen and the spore issue because those things are everywhere in the present day. Unless you're going to try to argue that somehow the distribution of pollen and spores in, in the past was somehow radically different than what we see in the present day. Okay, another key claim of young earth creationism is this idea of animal kinds that are independently created and then those individually created animal kinds will not share common ancestry with other forms of life. This was a lot easier to argue before we started doing DNA sequencing on different organisms. So a natural test of this hypothesis is to start doing DNA sequencing and comparing the DNA of different organisms. So what we see though, when we see that is, again, was not supportive of young earth creationism as a model. What we see is strong evidence that indeed there is shared ancestry across groups that young earth creationists would reject as related to one another. So humans is, would be one obvious example. We see examples that look, we see evidence that strongly suggests that humans are related to other forms of life in ways that young earth creationists would not accept. So what do young earth creationists do with this type of evidence? In large part, most young earth creationists don't seem to grapple with this evidence at all. Todd Wood is a notable example of that particular pattern. So he wrote a paper back in 2006 called The Chimpanzee Genome and the Problem of Biological Similarity. And I highly recommend it to you. If you just Google Todd Wood Chimpanzee 2006, you will easily pull that up. And this is what he has to say. He says, um, as a summary, when it is, is uh, in one paragraph of this paper, he's been talking about the different things that you see in genomes, and he says this is exactly this the expected pattern of similarity that would result if humans and chimpanzees shared a common ancestor. And then he says and that mice and chickens were more distantly related. The question is not how similarity arose, but why this particular pattern of similarity arose. To say that God could have created the pattern is merely ad hoc. So what makes Todd Wood very interesting and distinctive as a young earth creationist is that he rejects most of the explanations given by the young earth creationist community, and he rejects them as inadequate, and he feels they're actually holding young earth creationism back from a genuine model that has explanatory power because it's simply sidetracked into these arguments that aren't actually working. But then he says, okay, fine, I've gone through all these different models of young earth creationism, I've found them wanting. He says, I now find myself in the unenviable position of devising my own explanation, but he's honest to say, I don't have one. But the point he's trying to make in this paper is saying is, unless we admit we don't have a decent model, we're never going to generate a good one. So he, again, has come under quite a bit of flack for this particular approach. Unfortunately, research in this area seems to have stalled in a, lot, in a lot of ways since 2006. 2006 is when the comparison of the chimpanzee genome and the human genome was first published. And since that time, there hasn't been a huge amount of work in young creationism on that particular point. Here's just to make the point even further that Todd is quite a controversial figure within young earth creationism. He wrote this post a while back. This is from 2009 or so. He says he's quite a colorful character as well. Which I think you would have to be if you were going to take this particular stance within this movement. You would have to have, uh, you know, a, a good, um, a, you know, strong backbone and be willing to take criticism. 
He says, I hope this doesn't turn into a rant, but it might. You've been warned. Evolution is not a theory in crisis. It's not teetering on the verge of collapse. It is not failed as a scientific explanation. He goes on and on and on. It's well worth the read. It's still up online. You can go Google for it. If you just do Todd Wood, uh, Truth About Evolution, it will easily pull it up. Later on, he says, update. I'm getting a lot of traffic to just this one post, so I want to let all you one-hit wonders know about follow-up posts. And what did he have to do? He had to say, I'm a creationist. He had to say, I had, he had to reaffirm his creationist credentials because so many people were accusing him of being a closet evolutionist. So Todd is not a closet evolutionist. He is the real deal. And he's definitely well worth reading as an example of a younger creationist scholar. Okay. Scientists typically critique young earth creationism from the outside as a process of model building as opposed to doing the scientific method, the, sci the mainstream scientific method. Now, there's no nice and tidy summary of what exactly the scientific method actually is, so this is sort of a caricature, but you get the idea. Typically, in science, you make observations. Those observations might generate some questions. Why are things the way they are? You come up with a hypothesis that say, hmm, maybe the reason why these things are the way they are is because of this. Those hypotheses allow you to make a prediction, which you then test. This is what separates science from other types of activities. We, do, we not only come up with ideas, but we try to test them as rigorously as we possibly can. And we can either reject the hypothesis, where it's like, no, the test didn't work out at all, didn't, my prediction was completely off, or we may fail to reject the hypothesis. Now, this is important. We never, as scientists, accept a hypothesis, because that would mean that it's true, and we never need to evaluate it again. Failure to reject means we're going to continue to hold on to this hypothesis as potentially valuable, but we're going to test it again. And the idea is if you stay on that loop long enough and you fail to reject a hypothesis over and over and over again through repeated rounds of experimentation, eventually you come to a point where you say, well, this actually isn't a hypothesis anymore. This is what we would call a theory. So hypo just means less than, and thesis just is another word for theory. So a hypothesis is less than a theory. And eventually, scientists will say, well, OK, this idea is so well supported, we don't need to call it a hypothesis anymore. We can call it a theory. So young Earth creationism, as it's critiqued from the outside, uses a different approach. It uses what we would call, what scientists would often call model building. And the reason for this is that young Earth creationism cannot critique its hypotheses. Its hypothesis is, well, it's even not a hypothesis. It's a statement, the Earth is young. All the geologic layers come from the flood, and so on. So those, those ideas are not up for negotiation, which means even if you can't use them to generate successful predictions, you don't get to reject those ideas and come up with another idea that might have better explanatory power. So if you don't go back to reevaluating your hypothesis, that just forces you to make new predictions that you might be able to get with your previous one. But if you don't have something that has explanatory power, you're never going to end up with something that can actually predict accurately in real life. So what you end up with is something that's more like a model, a way of trying to explain why the data doesn't match up with what you know should be true, as opposed to using the scientific method. OK, what is young earth creationism's disposition to other groups? So Answers in Genesis as the main player, and um, ICR as a major player as well. Mo like most young Earth creationist ministries, they hold to this concordance view of scripture, and they also hold to what we would call a, a warfare model between science and faith. So they feel that modern science is an attack on faith, and that these two things are at war with one another. So here's just some comics that kind of make the point how they view um, their position vis-a-vis -vis other groups. So this one on the left is from Answers in Genesis, where this poor you know, fellow, he's so confused and so worried, says, look at all these other Christian views, Christian in scare quotes, of the origin of the universe. There's progressive creationism, gap theory, theistic evolution, and so on. He says, what do you believe? And you've got the very confident individual who simply says, I believe the Bible. So. The idea there, of course, is from within the viewpoint, this is how they view themselves. They see themselves as strictly holding to the literal interpretation of the Bible as it should be interpreted, and that these other views are not appropriate for a Christian to hold. Here's what happens when you add evolution to the Bible from the Answers in Genesis viewpoint. And it also gives you some insight into how they view Christians who might 
think that evolution might not be problematic for um, Christian faith. You know, don't worry, we can add evolution to the Bible, it won't cause any damage, and then, you know, this evolutionary fish goes and wrecks parts of the Bible, and then they, that person says, well, you know, that wasn't important anyway, so it's fine. Okay, so here's Ken Ham again saying, you know, that there's a battle on, there's that worker language again. It's not about young earth versus old earth. It's not about billions of years versus six days. The real battle is about the authority of the word of God versus man's valuable opinions. Now, someone who's a, crit a critic from outside the young earth creationist community would challenge the young earth statement here that it's not so much the authority of the word of God that's in question, but it's their particular interpretation of the word of God. But that's just part of the, part of the, uh, the discussion there. And here's Ken again, just to make the point one more time. You will often see compromise language in young earth creationist uh, literature. The idea being, again, not compromise in a nice way. Sometimes we talk about compromise as a good way to like, sort of make you know, an equitable solution to people that disagree. But in, in young earth creationist literature, compromise language means compromising on the authority of scripture, comprom compromising on key essential parts of the faith. Now, they're also very, Ken is very careful to say that it's not a salvation issue. So they're very clear to say that young earth creationism is not necessary for salvation. But they say that it's an important issue for the authority of scripture. So they're willing to call the old earth creationists and evolutionary creationists Christians, but just compromised Christians. Okay. Ironically, as we mentioned before, young earth creation, present young earth creationism would view other young earth Christians from the past as having a compromised understanding of scripture. So even though young earth creationism claims a long pedigree within the church, it doesn't take long uh, from a historical perspective to find individuals that hold young earth views who nonetheless would have a biblical interpretation of Genesis that would sit at radical odds with what Ken Ham is uh, proposing. So here's a uh, one of the church fathers, Origen, writing about Genesis. He says, you know, for who that has understanding will suppose that the first, second, and third day in the evening and the morning existed without a sun and a moon and stars, and that the first day was, as it were, also without a sky? And who is so foolish to suppose that God, after the manner of a husbandman, planted a paradise in Eden toward the east and placed in it a tree of life, visible and palpable, so that one tasting of its fruit by bodily teeth obtained life, and again, that one, that one was a partaker of good and evil by masticulating what was taken from the tree. And if God is said to walk in the paradise in the evening, and Adam to hide himself under a tree, I do not suppose that anyone doubts that these things figuratively indicate certain mysteries, the history having, been take, having taken place in appearance and not literally. So interestingly here, we have a young, earth, a young Earth creationist church father, because everybody was Young Earth creationist back then, nonetheless taking a view of Genesis that is radically opposed to Young Earth creationists in the present day. So origin is compromised, as it were. Okay, let's look at Old Earth creationism. And these other ones will go faster because there are less differences to talk about. So the basic view, if you're an Old Earth creationist, you feel that the Bible is also the inspired and inerrant Word of God, except the main difference here is that you feel a conservative exegesis or interpretation of Genesis fits just fine with an Old Earth. So current consensus for the age of the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, and a current estimate of the cosmos' age is about 13.8 billion years old. And Old Earth creationism accepts all the science that supports those observations without any problem. Where Old Earth creationism is distinctive um, compared to other views is that despite accepting that evidence for geological and cosmological history, Old Earth creationism all maintains that all species are created as separate kinds and that they're created by God over a long period of time. So do you remember how we talked about young Earth creationists have this view of massive speciation that occurs after the flood as the animals get off the ark and there's those massive speciation events that take place? Old Earth creationists actually reject that large amount of speciation. Old Earth creationists don't have a need to have that amount of rapid speciation because they believe that the flood, the flood was not global and as a result didn't kill every organism on the planet except what was on the ark. And as such, you can have speciation happen at a much more gradual pace because you're not starting from this very small group of organisms that was on the ark. So interestingly enough, Old Earth creationism, though it accepts mainstream science for 
cosmological history and geologic history, is more adamant about rejecting biological science when it comes to evolution than younger creationism is. Younger creationism expect, accepts far more speciation than older Earth creationism does. Okay, the key organization, if you're an old Earth creationist, is the organization Reasons to Believe, which some of you may have heard of, headed up by physicist, uh, astronomer, and physicist Hugh Ross, Dr. Hugh Ross, and uh, biochemist, chemist uh, Fazel Rana, Buzz Rana. I've also had interactions with, um, with Buzz, and we've shared the podium at different times, and I consider him a friend as well. So this is a group that has a modest but measurable impact on the current origins debate in North America. They don't have the appeal and clout in large numbers that uh, younger creationist ministries like Answers in Genesis and ICR have, but nonetheless they make a modest impact on the origins debate in North America. As we mentioned before, what you dispute or reject if you're an older Earth creationist, as opposed to that sort of laundry list of things that you, you object to if you're a young Earth creationist or a geocentrist, with older Earth creationism, the only thing remaining that's disputed is biological evolution. So as such, the same lines of evidence that we've seen for young Earth creationism that are problematic for young Earth creationism also come back to haunt old Earth creationists as well. Especially, you know, even more so, young Earth creationists actually have more breathing room on this particular point than old Earth creationists do, because young Earth creationists are willing to accept a large amount of speciation. So they're okay with common ancestry for large groupings of organisms. But old Earth creationists feel that there can't be any or very, very little speciation at all. So they're much more pressed by the DNA or the DNA evidence that we see. So again, we can make the same prediction that DNA sequencing should demonstrate differences between organisms that reflect independent creation. The test for this, of course, is just to compare a sequencing and compare DNA. And again, the DNA evidence, unfortunately, for this particular view strongly supports common ancestry between different organisms. So what do older creationists do with this evidence? Unfortunately, and I'll try to say this as dispassionately as I can, it's my scholarly um, impression that this community, the older creationist um, ministry community, for the most part have not accurately represented this data to their constituents. I don't think you can read older creationist literature and get an accurate understanding or accurate impression of where the data lies when it comes to DNA sequencing. Here's just one example from uh, Reasons to Believe where they were disputing the level of DNA similarity between humans and chimpanzees when the two genomes were published, and they dispute it. They say that it's less than what is commonly accepted to be by scientists. And they say, you know, even though many evolutionary biologists consider this 99% similarity between humans and chimps as profound truth, it turns out to be largely useless information. The genetic similarity between humans and chimps doesn't explain why there's such a fundamental biological and behavioral difference between these organisms. And actually that, in some senses, is accurate, but it's misleading if the take-home message from it is that you think, oh, therefore the, the DNA differences must be much greater. Interestingly enough, if you're an older creationist, you can get critiqued from both sides. So you can get critiqued by Christians who accept evolutionary biology, and you can also get critiqued by younger creationists who might dispute your views of, you know, if you're so, if you're an older creationist and you're committed to the fixity of species or very close to it, you can be critiqued from a young Earth pers perspective as well. So in that paper I referenced prior by Todd Wood, the young Earth creationist, he actually takes Rana to task on this particular point and saying he's, he's not happy with the way uh, Rana is dealing with this data. So he's actually pressing Rana on this particular point and saying that he hasn't got the science right. So we've got this interesting dialogue between a young Earth and an older Earth creationist perspective on this. Okay, if you're an older Earth creationist, what do you view as strengths from within the group? You feel that you are standing strong on, a, on the authority of scripture. You have some, a reasonable amount of support among educated North American Protestants. Older creationism does not promote a warfare approach to science and faith for many areas. It does somewhat on the evolution front, but it's also making, it's promoting a, a reconciliation model for um, cosmological history and geological history. Weaknesses, as viewed, as viewed by critics from outside the group, of course, are the lack of scientific support for its key 
anti-evolutionary hypotheses. And as we've seen, critiqued from young Earth creationists for not handling the genetic relatedness data accurately. Okay, what about disposition towards other groups? We've seen how young Earth creationists are quite antagonistic, generally speaking, as organizations to other groups. On the other hand, older Earth creationists are not antagonistic in that same way. So older Earth creationists challenge both young Earth creationists and evolutionary creationists on their views of science and scripture, but they generally have a warm disposition to other groups. Reason to Believe, as one example, has worked with BioLogos, which we'll see in a minute is the main uh, evolutionary creationist organization on joint projects. And you'll, you can also find uh, videos online where um, Buzz is speaking warmly about evolutionary creationists and referring to them as his brothers and sisters in Christ and that sort of thing. So there's this warm dialogue they, between the groups. So they view themselves as having the best model. Of course, everybody in the different positions views themselves as being, you know, having the best way of looking at this. But they also feel that these views are not worth dividing the fellowship of Christians. You're not, it's not worth dividing over. So that is somewhat different from what we've seen in the younger creationist community. Okay, last one, evolutionary creationism. Sometimes referred to as theistic evolution, although lately there's been a shift towards using the term evolutionary creationism as a way to underscore that it is a form of creationism. Theistic evolution also sounds a lot like deistic evolution, which is a very different way of approaching things. Deistic evolution is kind of like God wanted it up at the beginning and then just let it go and isn't, and isn't interacting with it anymore. And that's not evolutionary creationism at all. So an evangelical take on theistic evolution has in recent years taken on the label of evolutionary creationism. So what do you hold to if you are an evolutionary creationist? You feel that the Bible is inspired and, and authoritative, and some within the movement would hold, would be happy with the word inerrancy as well. Some in, in the movement are not, would not claim the word inerrancy. Typically in this group, you would, if you had, had uh, questions about inerrancy, you would probably end up having a fairly long conversation with the individual about what they thought inerrancy actually meant as it pertains to science and faith issues. This group feels that exegesis of Genesis is just fine with an old Earth and an old cosmos, as we've seen with old Earth creationism. And we've also, but what's different here is that this is the first group which is also fine with evolutionary biology. So this group feels that a conservative exegesis of Genesis does not preclude an evolutionary understanding of creation. Typically, there's reference to understanding the original, the context, the genre, and the original intended audience of the Genesis narratives on this point. Generally, what you'll find within this group is that evolutionary creationists feel that what is being spoken to in Genesis does not translate to what we would have as moderns with our concerns about the physical origin and the physical creation of, of things. The idea here is that what God is actually speaking to in Genesis deals with the theology of what's going on and describing his covenant relationship with what he's making. So that it's not focusing on physical mechanism, but it's focusing on the actual theology of what's going on. Now we actually see some similarities there with Augustine. You know, Augustine, or Augustine, depending on how you pronounce it, he had that view as well, that what's going on in Genesis is a theological description of creation and not a material discussion of creation. So this group feels that humans are created in the image of God, that they share ancestry with other forms of life, and that these views are not in conflict with one another. So this is the first view on the spectrum, as we've seen so far, that doesn't dispute any particular area of science. They accept the scientific evidence for evolutionary theory, and they hold that evolution is the mechanism by which God brought about biodiversity on Earth. So key individuals in this particular movement, it might surprise you to see Charles Darwin, up there on the slide. Now, uh, Darwin, over the course of his life, had changing views on, on how religion might work or not work with evolutionary theory. But he was, at, at the time he wrote Origin, he was actually a Christian of some sort, possibly. But anyway, the view he actually puts forward in Origin is that he doesn't see that there's a conflict necessarily between Christian belief and what he's proposing as a scientific theory. Other people in the present day, uh, Francis Collins, you'll probably recognize as the uh, director of the National Institutes of Health. 
Francis Collins actually founded BioLogos, the BioLogos Foundation, um, back in uh, the mid 2000s. It's currently BioLogos is currently headed by uh, Deborah Harsma. Other individuals would be, say, biologist Silent Simon Conway Morris, uh, Dennis Lamaru, as an example, among others. The key organization, as I said, is the BioLogos Foundation, which promotes this view. Okay, strengths as viewed within the group. So this group would say, this view allows for full participation in science by those that hold it. There's nothing within science that is objectionable or counter to Christian faith, and this view would allow somebody to have full participation in present-day science from a Christian perspective. It's also growing in popularity, although it's a very it's very much a minority view at this point, I would say, just in terms of raw numbers. Younger creationism is still by far and away the most popular view, followed by older creationism and then followed by evolutionary creationism. It's promoted by scientists and theologians of quite high standing, and it promotes a reconcili reconciliation model between science and faith on all scientific fronts. Now, certainly, as it's critiqued by other views, so certainly it's critiqued by young earth creationists and old earth creationists, and typically it's critiqued on theological grounds. So it's viewed as theological compromise if you're a young earth creationist, or it's viewed as theologically troubling from an old earth creationist view. Okay, disposition to other groups. So BioLogos, again, is the main proponent, main organization that propone, um, promotes this view. Very much strongly feels about feels that gracious dialogue is a key part of its mission. So here's the rules. If you're going to come on the BioLogos website, which has a discussion forum, that is welcome to individuals of all views, and we see all sorts of people that come through with different views. BioLogos welcomes people that are supportive, people that aren't supportive, but what is uh, insisted upon is that there is gracious dialogue. So this is another group, like we've seen with old earth creationism, that doesn't feel that these are views that are worth dividing the body over, and that they feel is best that the conversation is best advanced by having dialogue between the different viewpoints. Okay, let's summarize, and then we will have time for some question and answer. So as we've seen tonight, Christians hold to a wide range of views on this particular topic. And again, no matter what view you take, someone is going to critique you for it. There's no view that's, you know, exempt from critique. Some views are concordist, other views are not concordist. That's not too surprising, though, because we've had non-concordist or concordist views for a long time within the history of the church. One of the things that I hope you take away from this talk is that the recent categories that are most loudly promoted, none of those categories can claim sort of uninterrupted um, tenure within the church as a theological model for how we interpret the opening chapters of the Bible. So despite this variety, the, things that Christians, the thing that Christians do agree on is that God is the creator. So to paraphrase one of the creeds, that God is the creator of all that is, seen and unseen. So what we've talked about tonight are differences in the proposed mechanism for creation, but they're not differences in saying, well, one view says that God created and another view says that God didn't. These are all Christian attempts to explain how God created, but they all hold in common that God is the creator. I would also argue, I'll put my card on the table here, to say that I think that willingness to accept one another and dialogue with each other on these issues is more important than getting us all to agree on a particular point of view. Now, I think this is especially important from a pastoral point of view. Pastors in the present day have a challenge on their hands because they're going to have a range of views within their congregations. And what's more important, in my view, is that we have this conversation within the bounds of Christian unity as far as we can possibly manage. Now, as we've seen, that can be more of a challenge for different viewpoints along the spectrum because for some individuals, some, some viewpoints view other viewpoints as getting close to being outside the conversation. But nonetheless, I think we're better served by having warm conversation within as opposed to having a warfare type of model. Okay, I'll leave with this quote from Augustine, which I think is still valid advice. This is from the BioLogos website, and I think it's still valid advice for today. So he says, in matters that are so obscure and far beyond our vision, we find in Holy Scripture passages which can be interpreted in very different ways without prejudice to the faith we have received. 
In such cases, we should not rush in headlong and so firmly take our stand on one side that, if further progress in the search of truth justly undermines this position, that we too fall with it. That would be to battle not for the teaching of Holy Scripture, but for our own, wishing its teaching to conform to ours, whereas we ought to wish ours to conform to that of sacred Scripture. And with that, I'll be happy to take some questions and we can have some discussion. Thank you very much. Just a point of clarification. When sure. you say that younger creationism is the most popularly held view, yes. uh, were you referencing evangelicalism or Christianity is that's a very good question, a very good clarification. I think for Christianity as a whole, younger creationism may not be the most widely held. Because that if we if we're talking about Christianity as a whole we're including Orthodox Christianity and we're including Catholic Christianity. So that was a slip on my part. Certainly within Protestant Christianity, I would say it's probably the most widely held view. Certainly within the United States, certainly within North America, I would say. Once you get to Europe, it's kind of a different kettle of fish. There is far less younger creationism there, but there is still some there. But you're right, Catholicism and Orthodox Christianity typically don't have the same sorts of issues with evolution that Evangelical Protestant Christianity has. Although, we actually do see within Catholicism, and presumably within Orthodox Christianity, although I'm far less familiar with that, within Catholicism, we do see younger creationism within Catholicism, but it's typically imported over from Answers in Genesis, which is a, pro uh, a Protestant ministry. So there is some young earth creationism within Catholicism, but it's typically imported from Protestant young earth creationism. Really good question, though. Thank you very much. Yeah, back there. Um, question I've sometimes gotten from people is why, if you don't take Genesis quite literally in the way that it describes how God created things, how can you take the rest of the Bible, like anything that it teaches about God or theology, how do you know that God's accurate? Right. It's a great question. Maybe I'll just repeat it. I'll try to paraphrase it for the for the tape. Could you save the mic a little bit? Oh, sorry. Thanks. Yeah. So the question in general terms, I'm going to paraphrase a bit. You can let me know if I'm paraphrasing it accurately. Basically, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, if you're not taking Genesis literally and historically, how can you be sure, you know, how can you be taking other parts of the Bible literally and historically? Oftentimes you'll see the, the question, if you don't accept creation, they would say, then how can you be sure about the resurrection, those types of things. Is that a reasonable paraphrase of your, of your question? Okay, good. What that presupposes is it presupposes that our understanding, that particular understanding of Genesis is actually what the original authorial intent of Genesis was. So in some senses what it's basically saying is unless you understand Genesis in this particular way, which may well have modern scientific concerns tucked into it, then, then I'm going to be worried about you know, how you're taking the resurrection and things like that. But you see that that presupposes that there's that, that modern scientific way of looking at Genesis is in fact what was originally intended by the authors in Genesis and the original recipient congregation, that this is what God intended to communicate through Genesis. And a lot of biblical scholars would actually contest that point. They would say, you know, the more I look at this, the more I think that looking at this as a scientific document about how God materially created the world just doesn't work within an ancient Near Eastern culture. So they would push back and they would say, hmm, it really seems like when you take Genesis on its own terms, that those types of concerns about its historical accuracy or its scientific accuracy are actually an imposition of our way of looking at the world, and we're asking the text to speak to things that we that it actually was never intended to speak to. So that's where you would start, at least that's where I would start as part of that conversation. It also presupposes that the entire Bible is one genre, which manifestly it's not. And they wouldn't even say that it's all one genre. They would say, well, Genesis is obviously history, just like what we see in the Gospels is obviously history. But there's a very good case to be made, strictly on biblical grounds alone, that what we see in Genesis is a different type of narrative as opposed to what we see in the Gospels. But fantastic question. 
Uh, a resource that would be useful on that particular front would probably be John Walton's book, various books. Um, he's probably one of the best known proponents of that type of view of scholarship. So he's written a book, a couple of books, one's called The Lost World of Genesis 1, and then he's got another one out recently, which is The Lost World of Adam and Eve. And those <coughs> two together span Genesis 1 through 3. And try, in, in his mind, in, in John's words, he's trying to take Genesis on its own terms to the best of his ability. That's my follow-up question. I was wondering if it, uh, somebody like John Walton can be able to evolutionary creations as well. Yeah, a lot of evolutionary creationists um, think that, say, the views that John Walton have, has fits quite well with an evolutionary creationist view. John Walton himself would not claim to be an evolutionary creationist. He's interested in this discussion strictly from the biblical side of the equation. <laughs> but he also, you know, he's involved with biologos as well, so it's not like there's a complete disinterest. But John came to this, has come to this for many, many years, as his area of expertise is the ancient Near East and trying to understand the context and setting of Genesis in its own terms. Good question, though. Thank you very much. Yeah, here. Well, I'm not a scientist, and, and most people aren't, I assume. So, really, you have to just try to be an intelligent observer and ask good questions, and it, it becomes a percentage kind of a thing, right? So you look at the different views, and you have a percentage that you lean towards one or the other. Uh, I've done lots of research on it, read as much as I can. I lean towards the young Earth view, just because I've, I've looked into it so much. I don't, you didn't mention Ian Juby. I've looked into his stuff a lot in Genesis Week and that, and, that, and he tries to address the issues that come up. But one of the issues that I would ask about being an evolutionary creationist is that for modern scientists, there's a sort of an atheist view built into that, like um, uh, Perlinsky talks about in The Devil's Delusion. So they would argue that that's really a capitulation of your faith to science, and it, it gives us a door to just dismiss God. We don't need God. We don't need a creator. We've demonstrated that that's not necessary. So if you want to have your, your fairy tale sort of alongside of modern science, then that's fine. But we don't need that, and you've capitulated that point, really, in essence. Well, from an evolutionary creationist point of view, that question of, you know, science as it's practiced now, if it's inherently atheistic or if it's sort of taken in atheistic kind of presuppositions, is something that most evolutionary creationists and even older creationists would not agree with. And the reason for that is that they would, they would say that those types of views of science are a philosophical add-on that are go, about, go beyond what science can actually tell us. So science is a fantastic tool, in my opinion, for understanding the mechanisms that we can explore in creation through this method. And it's based on this idea. Actually, science, as you probably know, gets its origin in large part in Christian Europe because there's this conviction that, well, this what we see in nature should have order behind it and should have rationality behind it because it's a, it's a creation. It's the product of God's creative acts. Therefore, it should have order and regularity to it that we can study using the scientific method. And for me as a Christian and a scientist, I very much feel that, I feel very at home in that. So what you will see, you will see certain scientists who are maybe of the new atheist variety or whatnot who will try to make that argument to say that, no, science actually shows us that there's nothing beyond what science can describe which would be called sort of philosophical materialism, as opposed to what most scientists would call sort of methodological naturalism. The idea that when we go into the lab, I don't, in a scientific paper, invoke a miracle to explain what's going on in the laboratory and under my observations. And again, that comes out of this conviction that what I am studying is the order of the acts of God. So it wouldn't necessarily preclude that there is something beyond science, the atheistic scientists might try to make that argument and say, yeah, there's only, only science is all there is. The interesting thing is you can't use the tools of science to actually establish that. It becomes something of a statement of faith to say science shows us that there's only things that are accessible to science. So that would be where I would start to have that conversation. So I would say the idea that science is inherently atheistic is a philosophical add-on 
that's not part of science proper. But wouldn't you agree then that one of the key criticisms of, say, intelligent design is we don't need it? We've already sure. demonstrated we don't sure. need it. Sure, but, have, but, have, but, have, but um, atheistic scientists would say that about any particular Christian viewpoint because they're quite happy with whatever, that they, they're quite happy with a scientistic or a scientism way of looking at the world. So they would say, well, we don't need those explanations. But that presupposes that science, explanations coming from science and explanations coming from theism, explanations coming from God, are somehow opposed to one another or sort of a zero-sum game. So a young earth creationist very much might have that view that the more you explain through science, the more you've explained that God doesn't need to be an explanation for. But older creationists with respect to geology and astronomy and evolutionary creationists with respect to science as a whole would say, no, these aren't competing explanations. That even if we fully understand and fully explain everything scientifically, which obviously we haven't and we won't for a long while, if ever, probably not, even if we had that full explanation, it would not then result in a situation where we would say, ah, therefore God is completely superfluous. They would say, rather that what we perceive as natural is the orderly outworking of God's creative activity. Hmm. But now they wouldn't then say, ah, but this is something that allows us to prove that God is there, something along those lines. One way to think about it is, and again, I'm not a biblical scholar, I'm just a scientist, so I have to faith being, not that I faith being a biblical scholar, but you get the idea. I'm an amateur when it comes to that. But if you look in the Psalms, or you look at that sort of tenor of scripture as a whole, natural explanations in scripture are never presented as antagonistic to God's actions. They're never presented as something that is explaining how something works apart from how God is doing it. So like one example would be in the Psalms where it talks about how you know, the lions roar and they seek their food from God. Now, is that saying that lions, that God is directly feeding lions, or is it saying that the way the biosphere is put together allows for lions to do what they're doing, and that that is the action of God, that God is doing that? So I would argue that natural versus non-natural is not really a biblical way of looking at things. So one, one more follow-up. Don't, don't, wouldn't you agree that the whole enterprise of trying to demonstrate biological evolution is to show that it's done through natural processes? There's no directive force other than impersonal, <coughs> natural processes. That's the whole enterprise. If you capitulate that point, I mean, the people from Discovery Institute and Stephen Meyer and those people would never concede that point. That's the point they're trying to argue against. Sure, but... And if, Let's put it this way, those older, like the older creationists at the Discovery Institute, would they also say that the fact that they accept old Earth, the processes of geology and whatnot, that that somehow removes God from that process? They would say no, that God is actually a part of that as well. So again, it's based on this idea, which I would think of as a, which I think of as a misconception, that God explanations that come from God and explanations that come from science are somehow some sort of zero-sum game. I just don't look at it that way. I think I think the way the natural works, the way the natural world works, is a testament to how God put things together. And I think science is a God-given activity to explore how it works. So it's I guess it's just a different way of looking at things. Thanks for the questions, though. Other questions? Yeah? Would you give them the status that science has? in our culture. Why do you think the younger creation view is as popular as it is within evangelical expression? Good question. This actually somewhat goes to the previous question as well. We live in such a scientifically minded culture, as you've rightly pointed out. Our society places such a high value on science that if I said if I said something like this, I said, oh well that's not scientific. What am I saying? What would you hear me saying? You would say, well, that's not trustworthy. That's not true. That's not reliable. So we live in a society that so values science that we want, I think Christians in general, want to have, you know, they want to find science in the Bible. Because if you can find science in the Bible, then that would nicely you know, provide evidence that the Christian worldview is the right one in some ways. So if you can 
Science is so valued in our society, that's say for a young earth, I mean, I'm not a young earth creationist, so I have to sort of try to step into that mindset. You know, science is so valuable, so valued, and so pervasive in our society, and it's perceived as undermining Christian faith strongly from that particular viewpoint. So that's a huge amount of motivation to try to generate science of a kind, of a sort, that can act as a way to push back on what, we, what is seen as sort of the societal capitulation to science. So in some ways, it's actually adopting the mindset that the way you adjudicate these things is through science. But we have the better science, you know, from a younger perspective. So we have a better understanding of the way that the world works. Now, an evolutionary creationist perspective would be somewhat different from that. It would say, we don't necessarily expect Genesis to speak to modern scientific concerns in the way our society would expect. As a result, when I go to Genesis, I'm not necessarily looking for the counter-scientific explanation for how species came to be or how the world came to be. Now, that does remove a perceived apologetic, like a young Earth or an old Earth creationist at that point might say, ah, you're just giving in to the, the science of the age. You're giving up this apologetic to argue against that. But an evolutionary creationist would say, well, I don't know that I'm giving up anything. I'm trying to actually figure out to the best of our ability what Genesis is actually on about. And if it falls out from that, that it's actually not speaking to modern scientific concerns, well, so be it. I'm not interested in what it's actually speaking about. So that would be the sort of the differences that we would see between the different groups. Good question, though. Thanks. Yeah, back there. Sorry, I'm asking you to speak on a question related to your amateur biblical understanding. That's so, fine. <laughs> feel free to pass on it if you want. But I was just wondering how evolutionary creationists explain the, the doctrine of the fall and yep. if and how the fall influenced all of creation. Yeah. How does how do evolutionary creationists deal with the fall? You will find a range of different approaches on the fall within even within evolutionary creationism. Evolutionary creationism doesn't have sort of official views on things in the same way that, say, Answers in Genesis would have an official view or Reasons to Believe would have an official view. Older cre or, um, evolutionary creationism tends to be a little bit less concerned about hammering out specific views. What most evolutionary creationists would agree on, and older creationists actually, to a large degree as well, was would be that the fall didn't catastrophically change the physical constraints of the world, of the cosmos. That it didn't suddenly introduce things that weren't there before. So um, if you're an evolutionary creationist, you're comfortable with a large amount of death before the fall, for example. If you're an older creationist, you're comfortable with a large amount of death, animal death before the fall as well. Those kinds of things. Is that sort of touch on my graphic? Is death not perceived as part of the fall? Is death not? No, it would, it would be perceived as, um, like, to go back to Walden, for example, just as an example of somebody who's thought highly of in, in evolutionary creationist circles. Walden's view of the fall is that it was that the tree of life, it was access to the tree of life that actually provides the ability to not die. As in, like, why do you kick people out of the garden and keep them away from this? You know, because God says, you know, if they reach out and they take hold of it, they'll live. So that, in that understanding, humans would be mortal. Humans are not immortal, as it were. So they're created mortal, but they have access through their relationship to God, to the tree of life, such that if they continue to eat of it, that they won't die. But that when they're cut off from that, that they will die. And Adam, of course, like God says, you know, the day you eat of this, you're going to die. And then Adam lives for another 900 years, according to Genesis. So the idea is, is that he's been, he's no longer had, doesn't have access to the tree of life anymore, as opposed to, and then different evolutionary creationists would take different aspects of that narrative more literally than others. There's a whole range. Some evolutionary creationists view it as sort of an every person story, that this is a narrative that is describing all of humanity and all of humanity's interaction with God. I mean, after all, Adam means somebody who's from the dirt, and it means human in uh, Hebrew. So, you're, and 
Eve means mother, and mother of all the living. So we have a narrative about somebody named human, and we have a narrative about somebody named mother of all the living. So some evolutionary creationists look at that more as a narrative of describing everybody's relationship to God. Some evolutionary creationists, like John Walton, for example, very much feel that Adam and Eve are historical individuals that have a special called out relationship with, to God, sort of like Abraham is selected from a group to be a special representative. They feel that Walton well, feel that Adam and Eve were selected from a group to be have that special priestly role along those lines. Thanks though, good questions. There's lots you can read on the Biologos website on those particular issues, written by people who are actually biblical scholars. I could ask one. Okay, Mark. Yeah, you can ask one too. Um, so you know all the hard ones. Well, <laughs> I wondered if there was a space in your taxonomy, if that's the right word, of views for maybe a, a distinction within evolutionary creationism where belief in a historical atom might be some form of concordism, perhaps? Yeah. And then another view more like Dennis Lamoureux where yeah. he would say, no, that, he would say that. And I guess I wonder yeah. what you think about, about all this. About those issues? Yeah. Within evolutionary creationism, again, you see a range of views on some of these topics. So Walton would be one example of somebody who's quite certain that Adam and Eve are historical. Uh, N.T. Wright, I believe, would also have a similar view that Adam and Eve are historical and called out from a population. Although he hasn't written on it as much as Walton has, so I would be, you know, a bit reluctant to necessarily pin that on him. Uh, Denny Lamoureux would be someone who would very much say, no, Adam and Eve are not historical individuals. It's not a narrative about historical people. It's a narrative about everybody. That's like a thing. For me personally, the science tells us, and I didn't go into it here, but you can find lectures by me elsewhere that talk about this. The evidence we have very, very strongly supports that we come from a large population, that we don't solely descend genetically from two individuals. So I'm very comfortable with that. The science on that isn't going away anytime soon. What one does with that in terms of are Adam and Eve historical or not historical, that to me is a question that isn't as pressing to me. I'm actually fine either way. Okay. I think I lean towards non-historical, but I'm open to the possibility that they were historical. The idea is, or the thing is, is that you can't use science to adjudicate that one way or another, and biblical scholars are still having that discussion. So I'm happy to let that conversation go on for a while and see what comes out of it. You'll see in the book coming out in January with ah. Scott that Scott takes a particular take on that. And I told Scott before we started the book that I was fine with whatever view he decided to take. It's not a view that's easily encapsulated in a, in a short answer. He, and he looks at the intertestamental Jewish literature to see how the intertestamental Jews were looking at Adam and Eve, and he finds that they're using them in, in very flexible ways, very interesting ways. And Scott's contention is that is informing how Paul is picking up Adam and Eve. Because Adam and Eve are sort of a no-show after Genesis through most of the Old Testament. You don't really see them referred to as the reason for why sin exists or why humans are fallen, that type of thing. Then the New Testament shows up and you've got Paul using Adam and Eve in very specific ways. Well, there's that 400-year gap of silence that evangelical Christians just read past. We go from Malachi to Matthew and we blink and we don't think there's anything in the middle there. Well, there's actually 400 years of Jewish rabbinic literature talking about Adam and Eve and how that might influence us. And it's a very flexible and fluid way of using Adam and Eve. So all that to say, we'll have to see how Scott tackles it once the book comes out. Okay. Good question, though. Uh, Donovan and then Bill. Yeah. Um, from the evolutionary creationist point of view, how, how would you approach like something like human evolution and like uh, becoming a person or something like that? Like when, uh, if you subscribe to that idea, uh, how would an evolutionary creationist answer the question of like when people became people and, you know, formed a relationship with God? Sure, yeah. So when did people become people and when did we form a relationship with God? I actually hold the view that all species on the planet have a relationship with God that's appropriate to that species as it was created by God. So mm -hmm. that might seem a little odd, but I think crows have a relationship with the creator that in a way that's probably above what a starfish might have or what a slime mold might have. 
that type of thing. One way I think about this from a human perspective is I think God had a relationship with me all throughout my development as well. And I think that relationship extended to a time when I was not aware of God. So you can, the problem is, from an evolutionary point of view, is that what we see are continuums and gradients as opposed to clean-cut divisions. But we also see that in our own development. I can't tell you the day that I became an adult. You know, hopefully I'm an adult now, but when did I become an adult? Well, when I was 13? No. When I was 16? Well, you know, when I was 22? Uh, you know. So it's a gradient. But I think God had a relationship with me that was appropriate to my level of understanding all the way along. And I think that continues all the way back into my infancy and even in the womb. So I'm comfortable with God having a relationship with our lineage as it develops and becomes more aware as a population. I think God had an appropriate relationship with our lineage all the way along, just like he had an appropriate relationship with me throughout my development. I think if God can do that for individual humans now as they develop, he could have done it for our species. Some evolutionary creations, on the other hand, want more sort of punctate kinds of things where there's a point when God grants the image of God, or there's a point when you know humans become in soul labor soul beings, that type of thing. I'm very comfortable with the gradient at that point, but there's variation within evolutionary creationists on that point. Doug. You did not mention intelligent design in this discussion. Where yes. does that fit in these? Another very good question. I didn't mention intelligent design. Where does it fit? Well, the challenge is, is that intelligent design does not neatly fit into any of those particular categories. Most intelligent design advocates are older creationists, but not all. Some aren't Christians at all. Some are younger creationists. So the other thing is, is that every argument that is found within intelligent design is also found within young earth or older earth creationism. So, in some ways, intelligent design is a group of, organ of uh, individuals, it's an organization of people from varied perspectives that are not necessarily Christian, that wish to challenge what they call Darwinism, which is their sort of perception of what evolutionary biology, biology is as an atheistic, anti-God, random process that is devoid of God's purpose, that kind of thing, or devoid of purpose. So in that sense, intelligent design is not a strictly Christian view, although many intelligent design advocates are Christians. So it doesn't neatly fit into this taxonomy as a Christian, per se, view of evolution. So, But we can talk about individuals within the intelligent design movement, and we can describe and say, like, Paul Nelson is one example within the ID movement, would be a good example of a young Earth creationist within the ID movement. Stephen Meyer would be a good example of an old earth creationist within the intelligent design movement. But then say someone like uh, David Berlinski, who was mentioned earlier, as far as I know, uh, claims atheism, doesn't claim to be a Christian of any stripe, and as such would not be, you know, would not have a Christian perspective, would not be a creationist of that sort, but views design as an interesting hypothesis that he supports over and against what you would call Darwinism. So, does that cover what you're hoping for? Yeah. Um, you talked in, in both young Earth and old Earth creation about, I think you used the word speciation. Yeah. What, help me understand what the difference, how, how does speciation result in a bunch of species without saying the key word? Um, well, they would, they would call it speciation. So young Earth creationists are fine with speciation. So you have yeah. the same mechanisms? They would say it's the same mechanisms? Well, they we actually... Have, we have genetic diversity and we have some selection well, and... Yeah, they're okay with natural selection as a, a major part of it. Um, there's often uh, ideas within young Earth creationism that the original created kinds would have had all sorts of extra genetic diversity sort of loaded into them which then would allow for this rapid sorting out of different variants. But those views don't square with what we know about how genetics works. They don't easily square with that. So yeah, the challenge within scholarly young earth creationism is to try to propose a model for that sort of rapid, very, very rapid speciation on the order of like a species every year kind of species, because we've got 
so many species to generate, and you've only got you know a couple thousand years to do it in. So yeah, it is definitely a challenge. It's a challenge that older creation of them just doesn't have because they've got the luxury of all that time to let it happen. Although ironically, even with the luxury of all that time, they think God is independently creating all the species along the way. So the younger creationists could really benefit from all the extra time, and the older creationists could benefit from the speciation ideas that younger creationists have, but they end up in their separate ways in the end things. Yeah, question there. Yeah. Yeah, do you, do you uh, suppose, or do you, would you agree that uh, those people, I mean, we were talking about science today, and we are talking about theology. Would you agree that people that study literature have something to contribute to the issue? And what I mean by that is uh, cuneiform, the code to cuneiform, it was only broken recently by Roman British, you know, relatively recently. So. So the bulk of Near Eastern literature is, is relatively new. And my father, who was a uh, very evangelical uh, pastor and wrestled with these things uh, all his life, and I, I won't tell you where he was on that, but you know, he, he certainly had studied that. He was aware that cuneiform had presented us with a, another flood myth, Okay, or a flood story. Let's say to be a little less controversial, but but you know he assumed that that was derivative of the one in the Bible. As it turns out, it looks like it's the other way around. And now cuneiform, as they study the Near Eastern literature, they see you know that that uh, later creation poem of chapter one, which of course is a lot later than chapter, chapter 2, verse 4, they, they see that as a reaction to um, another creation story in the Babylonian, and, and, and very definitely trying to, to differentiate itself from the Babylonian. So, what about the, the role of these people who study the linguistics and look at, the, look at what it's referring to, and... and Look at the audience. I mean, the important thing is most people, aside from the young creationists, would look at say, okay, who was the audience for, 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 and that 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 makes a difference. And maybe the young creationists <laughs> would, would would say, no, that doesn't make a difference. We are all the audience. Yeah. You know. So, I, what do you think about that? Yeah, I would agree with what you're saying. Um, Ancient Near Eastern scholarship has come a long, long way in the last, you know, 50 to 100 years. We know now know a, so much more about the setting and context that the Genesis original Genesis audience would have been in. And Walton, as an example, it takes full use of that because that's his area of ancient Near Eastern studies. So it gives us. It, it, Walton likes to say we need to take our seat in the audience. The, the original audience of Genesis. We need to do the best that we can to get rid of our preconceived ideas about what Genesis should be saying from our culture, and we need to take our seat in the audience and listen to it as they would have heard it. I sometimes think, I sometimes talk about it like this, like, if you've ever heard a really good sermon at church where your pastor takes the time to really get into the context and setting of the original audience of, say, one of the Pauline epistles, something like that. So you know what it's like to live in Philippi, and you've got all that context, and then you hear what Paul is saying. It just opens up a whole new world. If you've ever had that experience. And that culture is light years closer to our culture than our culture is to the original audience of Genesis. So this idea that we could just pick up Genesis and read it in English translation and instantly understand exactly what's going on without taking our place in that audience, I think is something that is, we should not expect that we should be able to pick it up and just read it and, you know, not interpret it, but just go with what we think it says, because we're obviously going to be bringing our culture and our ideas to that text and expecting it to speak to us as moderns when it wasn't. It was addressed to a, a culture that's far, far removed from our own. <coughs> 
So Walton likes to put it this way. He said, God, um, Genesis was written for us. Absolutely. God intended us to read it and to understand it. But it wasn't written to us. It was written to a different culture at a different time. And we not only need to translate the Hebrew, we also need to translate the culture if we're going to take our place in the audience and hear what God is saying through those, those chapters. So yeah, very much so. Yes? Where do dinosaurs fit in? Where do dinosaurs fit in? From one, from any one particular view, or just in general? In general. Okay. Great question. So dinosaurs. Well, okay. I'll say I'll say this. Dinosaurs went extinct about 65 million years ago, according to mainstream science, with one exception. There's still one lineage of dinosaurs that's with us today, and that's birds. Birds are actually, the evidence we have is that birds are mm -hmm. the descendants of small, flightless dinosaurs, which is really kind of cool. Don't look, look at those crows a little bit From an evolutionary creationist perspective, it's, it's just accepted that that's part of science, that dinosaurs lived and died at that time, and that humans didn't coexist with them, that they were long gone before humans came on the scene. And that God was pleased to let these different lineages come to be in extinction, <laughs> and extinction is part of evolution as well. Uh, an older creationist perspective on that would be similar, in that they feel, but they would feel that God independently created all of those different dinosaur species in the distant past. A young Earth creationist perspective is actually that dinosaurs, like every other species, would have been created at the original creation week about 6,000 years ago and that humans and dinosaurs would have coexisted. So if you go to the Creation Museum, uh, the Ken Ham's Creation Museum, or the Ark Encounter or Project or whatnot, you will actually see dinosaurs portrayed, in, humans portrayed as interacting with dinosaurs. Now that doesn't fit any of the scientific evidence we, we have. We haven't ever found dinosaur fossils and human remains in the same way or at the same time. But that's the younger creationist perspective on it. So there's that sort of range of, of views on dinosaurs. What all three views agree on is that they're super, super cool. <laughs> <laughs> what, about the, uh, what about the soft tissue, the dinosaur soft tissue that was found? Yeah, look up the work of Mary Schweitzer. She's actually the person who, yeah. one of the key individuals, and she she very much rejects the young Earth creationist interpretation. So how do you resolve the dilemma that it wouldn't have lasted 65 million years? Soft tissue can't exist for 65 million years. How do you answer that? Well, the evidence we have is that soft tissue to a point can last that long. Here's one interesting question. If dinosaurs are really only, you know, 4,000 years old, why can't we get DNA out of any of them? Because we can get DNA out of all sorts of other stuff that's really, really old, too. And we've tried. So it's one of those things where, yeah, it just doesn't fit the evidence. But look up the work of Mary Schweitzer. It's really cool yeah, stuff. Right or other cool. Okay. Yeah, one last question. Let's make this the last question and we'll turn to the yeah, you know. um, to what extent would other religions share an evolutionary Oh, good question. Like a comparative religion kind of yeah, approach? Yeah, like Muslim scholars jump on board and... Ooh, boy. I haven't heard enough time fielding questions about Christianity yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, Muslims, Muslims generally have similar issues with evolution like younger creationists do. So, but that's in general. It's not absolute. You will find Muslim scientists that are fine with evolution as well. But as a whole, Islam tends to have um, its objections to, to, um, to, to evolution. And you'll often find younger creationists and Muslims making common cause in places like Turkey, for example. Um, other religions, I don't really know. I, don't, I can't speak knowledgeably. I, I've heard a little bit that maybe Hinduism might be generally okay with evolution because it sort of fits in with some of their some of their views, but I honestly don't know anything about it. It's a common knowledge. So. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh,